All right, example two is how to identify a polynomial from the graph itself, okay? Now, we said that a polynomial from the equation was easily recognizable because what do we know about the exponents on all the variables? They have to be what types of numbers? Whole numbers, and the domain has to be what? All real numbers. So we kind of finished up quickly on Thursday. Uh, this one on G simplified down to a nice polynomial, but remember, we have to look at the domain of the original function that we're given, and because we had domain restrictions, it is not going to be a polynomial. It'll graph as part of a polynomial, but it won't graph over all real numbers, okay? Now, for a graph to have nice positive whole numbers or zero as uh, exponents and have domains of all real, all real numbers, then you can spot the graph of a polynomial just by looking to see if it is not just a continuous curve, which means connected everywhere, right? Road, bridge, road. But it is connected how? Smoothly, okay? So you can spot a polynomial function if the domain is all real numbers, and it's smoothly connected everywhere. So let's just say if these are polynomials. P for polynomials or N for not a polynomials? Letter A, 2A. Uh, is that a polynomials graph? No, why not? It's not continuous. Okay, it's not continuous. Uh, the graph itself says that there's a break, which is a jump, and a hole. So it does look, wherever it does exist, it does look nice and smooth. It transitions from one y value to another pretty smoothly, but not continuous. So no. Letter B, is this one smooth and continuous? So the words say, yeah. So you can assume that it goes on forever like this. And notice there's no discontinuities, but it's also smoothly connected. If you were, like, uh, riding down this on a bike, it would be like, wee, this is a lot of fun. Wee, it's so smooth, right? It was, like, sanded with, like, a 220-grit sandpaper, right? Smooth. So this would be P, polynomial. All right, letter C. Is this one continuous? Sure is, but is it smooth? No, if you're riding on this one uphill, you're like, ah, ouch, there's a corner there. That hurt. You're coming up here, whoa, cusp, okay? What is a cusp? A cusp means a pointy thing on the graph. And a corner kind of is like a type of cusp, right? So we got two points right here, not safe for kids. So even though it's continuous, it's not smoothly connected. So this would be no, not a polynomial. How about this one? Is it smooth and continuous? It says it's smooth and continuous, and it is. So this would be another good one to like, have a roller coaster ride on. Wee, so much fun. Okay, good. So this would be a polynomial. Got it? Pretty easy. If the graph is connected smoothly and continuously, it, it might be a polynomial. If it's not, then it ain't going to happen. Okay, so what we're moving to now is the basic representative of polynomials of degree n. And then from these basic representatives of these polynomials of degree n, we can get other polynomials that are of the same degree but have a lot more elaborate local features, okay? So uh, we call all these functions parent functions, okay? Parent functions because other functions that are uh, the same degree but look differently could be considered offsprings of these or belong to the same family. Okay, now because they are single functions, parent could be male or female, but in this case, sometimes we call these not just parent functions, but sometimes we refer to them as mother functions, which is fine as long as you're very careful how you say it, okay? So it could be more fun to call it a mother function. So the parent function or the mother function for all lines in the whole wide world is simply y equals x, okay, y equals x. That's the parent linear function, the parent degree one function. So everything you study in algebra one, y equals mx plus b, they're all family members of the matriarch, I guess if you want to call it that, the mother function, y equals x. Okay, and that's what it looks like. It has a slope of one. Um, what's the domain of this function? All real numbers. What's the domain of any polynomial? All real numbers. What's the range of this function? All real numbers, yeah. Notice that the end behaviors, it comes in the bottom and it goes at the top. So the limit as x goes to negative infinity is negative infinity, and the limit as x goes to positive infinity is positive infinity. 
I'm going to go ahead and say it has opposite end behaviors. Does it have any symmetry? Even, odd, or neither? Y-axis origin or neither? It's not Y-axis, right? If you fold it on the Y-axis, it won't go inside. But what if you turn your iPad upside down? Does it look the same? Yeah, so that we would call that an origin symmetric or an odd function. Now, this is very important. An odd function talks about an origin symmetric function. The degree of this polynomial is 1, which is an odd number. So this is an odd degree polynomial that happens to also be an odd function. Slightly different. Okay, cool. Then the mother function for all quadratics of the form ax squared plus bx plus c, like we saw last Thursday, would just be the parent function y equals x squared. Um, what's the domain of this parent function? All real numbers. That should be the answer every time if we're talking about polynomials, right? But what about the range? Is it all real numbers? All positive numbers and zero. So zero, beefy bracket, infinity parenthesis. This one is bounded. This one is bounded below. Okay, it actually has a local minimum right there at the origin, which is also the absolute minimum. Okay, um, what about the, let's see, the end behaviors? Are they opposite end behaviors? They're the same. They have the same end behavior. So if it's top in, it's top out, and bottom in would be bottom out. Does it have any symmetry? Yeah. It has y-axis symmetry, so we call it a what? An even function. Now, again, the difference is that this is an even degree function that happens to also have y axis symmetry. Not every even degree function, as we know, is an even function. Okay, now we're getting into the parent function for all the cubics. And it's just simply x cubed. That's the monomial mother function. What's the domain and range? All real numbers. Now, I've seen that before. Where else did we have a range of all real numbers? On the linear. Linear was degree 1, yes. X cubed is degree 3. And they have the same range. What about the end behavior? Opposites, right? Opposite end behavior. And any symmetry? It has the origin again. So it's an odd function. Now, notice if we were just talking about these characteristics, you wouldn't really know if we were talking about x to the first or x to the third, right? In fact, the only difference between x to the first and x to the third is x to the third seems to be a little bit more wiggly than x to the first, yeah? x to the first, first is just coming straight through the origin, not wiggling at all. x cubed is kind of doing the same thing, but imagine that, you know, it's, it's getting tickled as it goes through the origin, you know, and it's wiggling around. Sweet. So they have very similar looking graphs. One's more wiggly than the other. And uh, x to the first and x to the third. Interesting. OK. Let's look at the next one. The next parent function is the mother function for all quartic polynomials. And it's just y equals x to the fourth. Now notice y equals x to the fourth sure looks a whole heck of a lot like what other mother function we just talked about, like the quadratic. OK? The only difference between this one and x squared, and I'll just say it looks like y equals x squared. I'm not going to write all that other stuff down because it's the same as x squared. Is the fact that it looks a little bit what near the origin? A little bit flatter? Yeah? And if you understand why, it, it, it should help you moving forward with all the others of the same type. If you pick a number between 0 and 1, like 1 half, what's 1 half squared? It's 1 fourth, right? What is one half though to the fourth power? It's one sixteenth. So x to the fourth looks a lot like x squared, except between negative one and one, it's closer to the x-axis. Okay, it drags. It's a little bit flatter. But by the same token, outside of one and negative one, what's two squared on the x squared? Four. But what's two to the fourth now? Sixteen. So x to the fourth is a lot steeper. Outside of 1 and negative 1, it's steeper than x squared. And between negative 1 and 1, it's flatter than x squared. 
But other than that, it looks a lot like x squared, yeah? Now, what do x to the fourth and x squared have in common? What do we know about their degrees? One of them is 2 and one of them is 4. Those are both what types of numbers? Even. Just like x to the first and x cubed look very similar, both of their exponents are odd numbers. Hmm. I wonder if there's a pattern here developing. Here's the parent function to x to the fifth. All of your quintic polynomials are family members of x to the fifth. Now, x to the fifth looks a whole lot like what? Yeah, it looks a lot like y equals x cubed. And it has all the exact same basic information. The only difference, again, is what? It's flatter or closer to the x-axis between negative 1 and 1, and it will be steeper outside of 1 and negative 1 for the exact same reasons. And you can even make the argument that x cubed was flatter or closer to the origin than x to the first was. Okay? So that's going to be true with all polynomials between negative 1 and 1 and outside negative 1 and 1. What do you think the parent function y equals x to the 6 is going to look like, which we just say is a 6-degree polynomial? Well, it'll look more like which one we've already seen. It'll look a lot like x to the 4th. Here's negative 1. Here's 1, bless you. It's going to come in pretty steep, and then between negative 1 and 1, it's just going to drag, 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 and then it's going to shoot up. Now, after a while, we kind of lose our ability to keep showing that repeatedly unless we zoom in. But you understand why. So if we had to, like, classify characteristics of all these polynomials, what do they all have in common? Their domain is all real numbers. Yeah. And all the parent functions also have some type of symmetry, yeah? Whether it's y-axis or origin, the parent function. But how do they differ? And could we classify them into subgroups based upon their differences? Yeah, the range is going to be all real numbers for polynomials of what type? Odd degree. Yeah, x to the first, x cubed, x to the fifth. They're going to have opposite end behaviors, and so the range is all real numbers. Whereas... The range is going to be bounded if the degree is what type of number? Even, right? So that's the purpose of this right here, classifying them as even-degree polynomials and odd-degree polynomials, okay? Now what we're going to do is we're going to review how to sketch things using transformations and some other techniques for sketching. We were able to skip transformations for the most part because you were – so well instructed in transformations in Algebra 2. It's really stepped up in that department. So um, let's just kind of re review quickly what I want to call the form in which we want to get our equations into when we sketch them by transformation. I call it the standard transformation form. Standard transformation form. And it looks like this. If you have any function f of x, it's a transformation of another function called g of x. It's going to be a times g of, and then you have what I call b times x minus c, close, close, and then plus d. So in parabolas, you probably just call it vertex form, and you didn't necessarily have one of each of the letters. But a, b, c, and d are going to affect an equation in a certain way, and they will always have the exact same effect or manifest themselves on a graph the exact same way. Now, the reason you want to write it like this is because it's not only in alphabetical order, right? A, B, C, D. But it's also in your Aunt Sally's order, your dear Aunt Sally, who insists that you do multiplication or addition first. Multiplication, yeah. So if you read it from left to right, notice A and B are your two multipliers. You would do those first and C and D are being added or subtracted. Now, very quickly, let's just talk about what these do. If we start with the function G of X and we transform it with A, B, C, D, then the A is going to do one of two things. It's going to be your vertical dilation factor. So if A is greater than 1, it's going to be a vertical stretch. If A is less than 1, but greater than 0, it's going to be a vertical compression. 
So like if A were 2, your graph would be stretched vertically by a factor of 2. And if A were a half, it would be compressed vertically by a factor of 2, by the reciprocal. But if A were negative, then what else does it do? Like X squared and negative X squared flips it across the X axis. Now there is a summary in 2 point, I think 5 in the previous section, if you don't want to write all this down, it's there. B then, moving from left to right, is multiplied, so it's a dilation, but it's inside times your X's, so it's going to affect the graph horizontally. And anything on the inside is the opposite of what it appears. So if B were a 2, it's not going to be a horizontal stretch by a factor of 2. Rather, it's going to be a horizontal compression by a factor of 2. And if B were a half, it would not be half as wide. It would be twice as wide. It would be a horizontal stretch by a factor of 2. And, of course, if B were negative, it's going to switch your X's, and that would be a reflection across the Y axis. We'll work examples. And then C is your horizontal shift, opposite of what it appears. So if that were X minus 2, it's right 2. If it were X plus 2, it's left 2. And then D, finally, on the outside of your function, affects the Y values, and it's exactly as it would appear. So if that were a plus 5, it's up 5. Minus 5 is down 5. And there's your standard transformation form. We'll get a lot of practice for that moving forward. <clears throat> okay, so the first thing you want to do when you're trying to sketch a function, then, before you even put it in standard transformation form, if you can, is to determine what the uh, parent function is. This belongs to the family of what? If you were to expand it out, you don't have to actually FOIL it out four times. Just realize that your first term, x, raised to the fourth power, is going to be your leading term. It's a parent function to x to the fourth, or the parent function is x to the fourth. Once you realize the parent function, x to the fourth, so it's going to look something like this, you decide if you can put it into standard transformation form or if it already is. Is this one? It is, right? It's like a 1 times 1 quantity x minus 3 minus 2. So the a and b here are 1, so this one is pretty easy. This minus 3 picks up the graph and moves the whole thing right 3 and then down 2. Now, you don't have to follow every single point on every single graph. If you have some distinguishable points on a function, like on x squared and x to the fourth, the vertex, if you know where the vertex goes and you know what the general shape looks like uh, from the vertex, you can just move that one point and sketch a graph. So let's go ahead and do that. This is moving at right 3 and down 2 in either order. They're both the same priority. So you can go down 2 and right 3 or whatever. But from left to right, it's right 3, down 2. So I'm going to draw my y-axis and my x-axis, and now I'm going to follow my vertex around. One, two, three, one, two. There it is. There's my vertex. Now it does open upward. Here's the only thing that I'm going to be requiring you in terms of detail. When this thing opens up and to the left, the question is, does it open very rapidly so that it crosses the y-axis in positive y-land, or does it open wide so that it crosses the y-axis in negative y-land? How could we determine without guessing what the y-intercept is? Yeah, plug in a 0 for x. When in doubt, find the y-intercept, because if you have it crossing in the wrong spot, you're going to lose points. Now, let's plug in a 0 right here. 0 minus 3 is negative 3. Negative 3 to the 4th is the same as positive 3 to the 4th which is 9 times 9, which is 81, minus 2 is 79. So the y-intercept is positive 79. The graph could be misleading, but the numbers don't lie. It has a positive y-intercept, so the graph looks like this. It crosses way up there, and you don't have to show it. Just don't show it crossing the y-axis in negative land. And you might be inclined to draw it crossing a negative land. I get it, because you know x to the fourth is wider, so you, you naturally draw it that way. But there you go. Now, it says to determine the end behavior of each, as well as the number of x-intercepts in relative extrema. So what do we know about the end behavior here? Same or opposite? Same. Okay, the end behavior is the same. It's degree four. We would kind of expect that. Um, how many x-intercepts does this one have? Two, the number of x-intercepts is two. 
How many did the parent function have? Let's come back up here. How many x intercepts did the parent function have? Well, one. An x intercept is either where it crosses or touches the x axis. And this one touches the x axis at the origin. It doesn't cross it. So the parent function has one x intercept. But this one here, just moving it down, has two x-intercepts. Um, now, relative extrema, if you remember, extrema is plural for max slash min. Okay? And relative is the same as local, either one. So how many local max or mins does this one have? Does it have any? Yeah, the vertex is the location of a local min. So this one has a local minimum of negative 2 at x equals 3. It's also the absolute min, but it's still a local min. So it has one local min. We're just counting numbers here. We're not getting real specific. So it has the same end behavior. It has two x-intercepts and one local min. Got it. What's the domain, just for what it's worth? RL numbers. But the range? Is bounded, isn't it? The range is everything, what? Greater than negative 2 or equal to negative 2. Yeah. So it has, it's an even function, and it's bounded onto the range. All right, the next one, part B. What's the parent function? X to the fourth. So this is a transformation of the exact same parent function. Is it in standard transformation form? Yep. So let's go from left to right. What is the negative in front of any function going to do to it? Flips it across the x-axis. So now it opens down. And then the plus 2 moves it left 2. The minus 3 moves it down 3. So your vertex is now at negative 2, negative 3, and it opens down. If you know where the vertex goes and you know what the shape of the graph looks like, that's really all you need. So negative 2, 1, 2, 3, right there. Now, when it opens down, is there any controversy whether it's going to cross the y-axis in positive or negative land? No. It's for sure going to cross the y-axis in negative land. So you don't even really have to find the y-intercept there unless the question specifically asks you for it. All right, same type of questions now. Um, how many, uh, what's, what, what do we know about the end behavior? Same or opposite? Yeah, it's the same end behavior. Same end behavior. How many x-intercepts? Very good. Number of x-intercepts? Zero. None. No x-intercepts. No real x-intercepts. We're going to learn something called the fundamental theorem of algebra uh, in the next section that will tell us that a fourth degree polynomial is going to have no more than four x-intercepts. Because solving polynomial equations back in the day was of huge importance because that was giving them the answers to life's meaningful questions back then. And they needed to know a way to, or they needed to know when to stop looking for x-intercepts. And so Gauss over there on the wall proved the fundamental theorem of algebra several times in his lifetime. And he basically said, if it's a degree four polynomial, it's going to have at most four x-intercepts. And we're going to learn in the section after that, then if they are not real x-intercepts, then they're going to have to be what? What other type of numbers do we have? If they're not real, they're... Fake, which is almost what Descartes called them. But back then, I'm not sure if fake was such a cool word, so he called them imaginary. Imaginary was an insult back then, like when you call someone fake, call them imaginary back then, it, was, it hurt just as bad. So he used the term imaginary, um, and he meant it derisively, but it kind of stuck. So if they're not real, they're imaginary. But here we have no real solution. Now, how many uh, relative extrema do we have? One. We have one local max. Okay, sweet. Um, domain, we can get the range from here pretty easily. It's bounded. It's bounded. All right, so those are graphing them by transformation. Now let's look at part C. What's the parent function here? It's also x to the fourth. But this one is not going to be so easy to get in standard transformation form unless we do some kind of completing the square, which I'm not going to do, because it has another term after it um, x squared, but the degree is still 4, and so this is going to be a transformation of our parent function. Now, here's another way to sketch it uh, if you can't get into standard transformation form. 
if you can find the x-intercepts and you look for any kind of symmetry and you know the end behavior, those three things will get you far. Find the x-intercepts, look for any symmetry, and analyze the end behavior. Okay, the first one first. How do we find the x-intercepts of any function? What do we do with its equation? Set it equal to zero, okay, because those are also known as roots or zeros. Hey, and it's like we're warming up again, right? Once you set it equal to zero, you what it? Factor it. And the first rule of factoring is common factor. Is anything common here? A 2x squared, yeah. And that leaves us with an x squared minus 4. And we're not done yet because we can factor now the difference of squares factors into the product of two conjugates. Make sure you keep it equal to zero. Now, again, you don't have to show that you're setting each factor equal to zero in solving. You can use the factor theorem because if you know a factor, you know a root. If you know a root, you know a factor. So what are the factors? I'll do 2 comma negative 2. Those are the easy ones, but the easiest one, I think, is the one in front that people tend to overlook. What value of x, when you plug it into x squared, gives you 0? Zero? 0. Yeah. What about 2? Is 2 a root? No. We're looking for the values of the variable that, when you plug them in for x, causes 0. Okay? So let's see what that looks like. If we want to try and figure out what a graph looks like, we can throw the x-intercepts down. Gives us a starting point, so there's zero. It's going to call that negative two, and equidistance over here is positive two. Cool. So we have that much known. All right, now the next thing, symmetry. Symmetry is useful when you're trying to sketch a function. Does this function f of x have any symmetry? And by that I mean is it even, odd, or neither? Even. Did you say neven? Even, okay, because Neven would sound kind of like Negan, and that guy was bad. Just in case, Negan was bad. You might like that right there. Neven, no, you said even. Good, because remember, if you replace X with negative X on both of these, because they're both the even powers, you're going to get the same output, whether you plug in a positive or a negative. So an even function has what type of symmetry? y-axis symmetry. So this has y-axis symmetry. Now that's important because if you know what the graph looks like in quadrants 2 and 3 or 1 and 4, you know what it looks like in the other two quadrants. Yeah, yeah? Yeah, 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 cool. Now the last thing we need is the end behavior. How do we figure out the end behavior? Well, that's the limit as x goes to infinity. And remember, if you have more than one term, which term is the one that dominates the growth for huge values of x? What do we call that term in the front with the largest exponent? The leading term. So if you just plug in an infinity, infinity to the fourth is infinity times positive 2 is positive infinity. Now, because it has y-axis symmetry or because it's an even function, remember up here, every time we had an even degree function, the end behaviors were the same. Guess what the right end behavior is? The right end behavior, remember, is the limit as x goes to negative infinity. It's got to be the same. So here's what we know. This graph comes in from the top, and it goes out the top. Sweet. So now we come over here. I'm going to choose pink. It's going to come in the top, and it's going to go out the top with y-axis symmetry. Now here's the last little piece of information we know to make this thing work. We need to know, aside from the end behaviors, we need to know what's called the multiplicities of the root. Have you all heard that term before, multiplicities? It's like a m movie in the 90s with Michael Keaton. <laughs> Not his best work, but anyway. Um, multiplicity is how often a root occurs. Okay, let me write that down. The multiplicity of a root, the multiplicity of a root is how many x-intercepts it counts as. Okay, now let me tell you what I mean by that. 
As I mentioned in the next section, we're going to be talking about what's called the fundamental theorem of algebra, which says that a degree 4 polynomial can have no more than four x-intercepts. Now, we've already seen in some of the examples that it doesn't have to have four real x-intercepts. It can have two, it can have one, like the parent function, or it can have zero, um, like the one that opened down. But if they're not real, they have to be imaginary up to multiplicity. So if you looked at this function right here, um, well, let's, let's look at x squared. Let's look at x squared and x, okay? Notice the exponent on the x to the first in the linear function is 1. It had one x-intercept, and it had one at most. Now, how would you describe the way it crosses the x-axis there? If I asked you to describe how it crosses the x-axis, what would you say? Anything fancy going on? No, it's pretty, pretty basic, right? So you might just say, <laughs> what do you mean, describe how it crosses? It just, it just shoots across, just like, whatever. It's just crossing, right? Just crossing. It's no different there than it is anywhere else. It's just shooting across. I'd be like, okay, cool. I'll go with that. We'll just call that a cross or a crossing. Now, over here at x squared, it doesn't actually cross the x-axis, does it? How would you describe what's happening on the x-axis right there at that x-intercept? Does it cross? No, it kind of goes like, boy, to influence your description. Would you say that it uh, boings over there? Or bounces? Yeah, good. Bounce. That's what you're thinking, right? So notice that it's an x squared. Here's the difference. If it's an x to the first, we call that a single root. It counts as one x-intercept. Or we say it has a multiplicity of one, which we write as m1. The exponent on the factor that causes the zero, namely x, gives you the multiplicity of the root. It's pretty nice. And every time it's a 1, you have a single root or an m1, it shoots straight across. But over here, we have an exponent of x squared. We call that a double root because it's a double factor. You can write x squared as x times x, right? So if you have two factors of the same type, you're only going to have one representative value, but it's counting as two x-intercepts, so we call it a double root. And guess what a double root's always going to look like on the graph? That's right. A bounce. It's a bounce. Now, you can actually see graphically why it, it's accounting for two x-intercepts. Let's say it had intentions of bouncing off the x-axis and going, going back up. So let's say that it overshoots its target just a smidgen. And it's like, oops, I overshot my target. But guess what? It has to go back out the top. So the fact that it only bounced gave us one x-intercept, but it took up one, two. He said, oh, 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 I got a, I don't know. I feel hollow inside. Oh, oh, wrong season. Negative, okay, it counts for two x-intercepts. You see that? It could have crossed going down, and it could have crossed going up, but it didn't. It bounced, but it is hogging up two possible solutions to the solution when it equals zero. To the, I messed up now. I didn't even get the joke. What does the jack-o'-lantern say to the bunny? <laughs> to the therapy session, I feel hollow inside. There are better jack-o'-lantern jokes than that. <laughs> Okay, anyway, um, die every day. Why? I don't know. Okay, so here we go. Negative 2 and positive 2 have exponents of what? 1. So they are single roots, which means we're just going to do what on the x-axis there? Cross or bounce? Cross. Now, x squared, much like the parent function x squared, it has an exponent of 2, so it's a double root, so it's going to... Bounce. All right. So if we know that, then here's what we can do. We're going to come down. We're going to cross the negative 2. We're going to go to some arbitrary low point, and we're going to approach 0 like we're going to bounce off of it. 
Now, again, because it has y-axis symmetry, if we know what it looks like over there in quadrants two and three, all you have to do is reflect that across the y-axis, or in this case, just kind of do a mirror image thing, and there you go. You know what the graph looks like. Now, how many x-intercepts does this one have? It only has three physical manifestations of x-intercepts. Okay? It only has three. How many local max or mins? Two mins and one max, so a total of three. And, of course, the end behaviors are the same. All right, so what I'm trying to get you to realize here is the relation between the degree and the number of x-intercepts slash local max or min. Okay, up here, the parent, well, the parent function was degree four, and it had one x-intercept and one relative max or min, namely a min. Here's one that was degree four, that had one local max or min, but two x-intercepts. Here's one that had only one local max or min, but zero x-intercepts. Now we have one here with three local max or mins and three x-intercepts. And now we're gonna squeeze this last one in here unless they come back in with another Halloween joke. What's the parent function on this one? If you were to expand it out completely, your leading term, and this is important, would just be x squared times x squared, which is x to the fourth, times negative three. The leading term is really all you need. This is gonna be a fourth degree polynomial. And we're not gonna put this one into standard transformation form, rather, we're gonna factor it. x minus one, x plus one, x minus four, x plus four. If I set it equal to zero, what are my x-intercepts? We had two differences of squares. We get x equals one, negative one, four, negative four, and what about negative three? Is negative three a solution? No, because it's not a variable. Now, what are the multiplicities of each of those four roots? One, because each of the exponents on the factors are one, they're all M1s, so they all count as single roots. How many did we find? Four, is the search over? A fourth degree polynomial, we found all four roots, we know there's not gonna be a fifth, so therefore negative three for sure can't be one. Now let's go ahead and see if we can sketch it. Uh, here's negative one, here's positive one, here's negative four, here's positive four. Does this function have any symmetry? Even, odd, or neither? It's an even function, yeah. X squared, X squared, you can kind of tell by the roots. What about the end behavior? As I go to infinity, what's the limit as X goes to infinity? Well, really, remember, you only need the leading term, yes? Which is easy to get without expanding the whole thing. Negative or positive infinity to the fourth is positive, times negative three is negative. Now, because the right end behavior is negative infinity and it's an even function with y-axis symmetry, guess what the end behavior is on the other side? It's the same, negative infinity. So here we go. They're all m one, so they're all crosses. So it comes up like this, it crosses crosses, it has a negative y-intercept, and then by symmetry it goes up just as high on the other side and goes down. So it kind of looks like an M. Last thing here, how many x-intercepts do we have? Four. How many local max mins? Three. All right. On Monday, we're going to see if we can figure out the pattern, the relation between the degree and the number of x-intercepts, Today is Monday, Tuesday. That joke still got me. I'm still trying to figure it out. The relation between the degree and the x-intercepts and the local max or min. Have a great day. Try not to feel empty on the inside, like a jack-o'-lantern. At least put a candle in there or something to burn brightly. Maybe they call that heartburn. I don't know. Now, there's the start of a new pumpkin joke.